Hello, everyone, and welcome to our final Ed Talks of the 2020-21 season, our ninth season, and one that was wildly different than everything that came before. Uh, my name is Adia Morris, and I'm excited to be with you tonight as the event MC. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, we are all coming to you virtually from Minneapolis, St. Paul, Minnesota, or Minnesota Makoche. This is the homeland of the Dakota people. It's important for us to recognize that unless we're indigenous we land to characterize the legitimate treaty in 1805. We recognize the acts of genocide committed against Native people, and most importantly, we acknowledge that Indigenous people are still here and present all around us. As we gather together here, uh, I ask that you keep the troubled history of our state in your hearts and minds. I'm really excited about the Ed Talks presentations we have in store for you this evening, which are about the power of youth leadership and voice, and the importance of centering young people as leaders and leadership influencers. So before we get started, uh, I wanna take a moment to thank our generous sponsor, the Bush Foundation. Bush Foundation has supported this program for many, many years, and we continue to be so grateful for their partnership. We're also so thankful for the additional support they'll be providing for Ed Talks in our next season. We've pre-recorded both the talks for this event tonight to make sure that the technology works smoothly, as we all know it doesn't always. However, our presenters are going to be online with us live uh, after both talks to participate in a Q&A at the end of the program. Speaking of which, if you have a question, please type it in the Q&A at any time throughout the presentations. Uh, but bear in mind, we won't get to questions until the end. The event is scheduled to end at eight o'clock, uh, but our speakers are willing to hang on a bit longer if we need more time to get to more questions. We'll also encourage you to engage with social media during and after this event. You can use the hashtag EdTalksMN, that's capital E, capital D, capital T, A-L-K-S, capital M, capital N. This event is being recorded for our EdTalks video and audio libraries, which you can find by visiting our webpage at achievempls.org slash edtalks. So let's get started. I am delighted to introduce our first presenter of the evening, Makisha Nation. Makisha's career has centered around health and educational equity for the past 20 plus years. She is executive director of Teach for America Twin Cities, a national nonprofit that believes all students should have the opportunity to attain an excellent education. Makisha has previously worked for Breakthrough Twin Cities and Target. She sits on the board for Lundstrom Performing Arts and also serves as a coach and advisor for Upturnships, which provides leadership training and internships for college students of color and students from low income and first generation backgrounds. Makisha also participates in the Minnesota Young American Leaders Program and the Minnesota Women's Economic Roundtable. Welcome Makisha, we're so glad you're with us tonight. Thank you, Audia. As a little girl growing up in Jamaica, I was always trying to make sense of the world around me. I was very precocious and inquisitive, taking every chance to ponder questions I had with parents and adults. I loved school so much that sometimes I'd miss my bus on purpose so that my class teacher, Miss Box, would have to take me home and I'd get to spend extra time with her. But that all changed when I migrated to the US. Instead of being celebrated by the teacher and adults responsible for my education, my perceived differences were seen as shortcomings. They assumed that because I was from a small island country, I wouldn't do well. How could a bright, precocious girl who began reading at the age of four almost get labeled for special education? My kindergarten experience was very difficult for me. I continued to not be believed in by my educators that were supposed to believe in me the most. At one point, my teacher suggested keeping me back a grade. At this point, my mother, seeing me and knowing me, advocated for me and had me assessed through a test. The results of the assessment showed that I was actually more accelerated than the grade I was in. I was finally placed in an educational setting that was suited me and in which I could thrive. But I know if my mother hadn't advocated for me and stood fast to her high expectations for me and listened to what I was saying, I would have been confined to my school's definition of what they thought I was capable of, and I wouldn't be standing here today giving you this talk. 
In my culture, my ancestors have shared that there is wisdom in the voice of youth and in the exchange of knowledge across generations. Youth are seen as actors in community and the stories I grew up with model communities where children hold autonomy and agency. Perhaps this intentional effort in elevating youth voice comes from understanding that collective success comes through community building and collective community success. In the US, our society often makes decisions that have far reaching implications for the lives of young people without considering their perspectives, their needs or desires. There is a need to cultivate a culture of love in youth, to be their champions and to understand them. As someone who's worked in youth development for 20 plus years, my greatest source of inspiration and lessons have come from the incredible students that I've had the privilege to partner with on their journey for change and growth. I have learned alongside them. Today, I want to share five lessons that I have gained from listening to the perspectives of students and youth with you. How these lessons can influence change making and shift power dynamics in education and youth programs. Essentially, I want to talk to you about learning because learning is at the heart of teaching and in the heart of mentoring young people. Two years ago, I had a chance to visit a school in South Minneapolis that focuses on project-based learning and understanding students' needs and challenges. I sat across the table with 10 students and asked them questions about what an excellent education means to them and what a great educator truly looks like. When I asked what an excellent education meant to them, one student said, I feel like a good education is centered around each student's needs and personalized for each student. Another student, when asked what makes a good teacher said, someone who respects you and loves you and is willing to do the things, do things differently. They don't have that kind of attitude like they know what's best and they know everything. As I had these conversations with these incredible students, I heard time and time again, their desire to be understood, to be held accountable for their goals and to hold their teachers accountable. At previous schools, some of these students felt like their teachers approached things from a I'm right and you're wrong attitude. But relationship building was at the core of their success. They said that when they didn't have a relationship with their teacher, those teachers ended up not having expectations for them that made sense for them. And they weren't rooted in their aspirations. They talked to me about this notion of creating a new relationship with students and teachers each and every day and rebuilding that from scratch in ways that had shared accountability and expectations. So what happens when we actually stop and ask students what they want? When we shape our expectations based on their aspirations and the knowledge that they are capable of so much. Studies have shown that having a teacher of color or an educator trained in culturally responsive teaching practices in the classroom creates a positive impact for students of color. At the heart of one study they found, the reason teachers of color had such an impact on students from the same communities was because they held high expectations for their students. This comes from knowing your students, being unwavering in their belief in their brilliance. So being taught by someone from a similar race or similar life experiences is transformational for students who face barriers to academic success. But white teachers willing to invest in anti-racist learning themselves that commit to learning about their students' culture, their beliefs, their values, can create meaningful relationship across lines of difference. When teachers understand their students, they come to expect more from them and students grow their own belief in themselves to reach higher. Optimism and hope are the underpinning forces in this practice. It is truly remarkable how having a commitment to work with young people can truly make a difference in their relationship, in your understanding of your students, and how having them inform expectations that you set can serve as a guide, almost a blueprint, to create an enriching and fulfilling experience for students where they not only learn, but they lead and they thrive. For my next lesson, I'd like you to take a look at this, this image. What do you see at first when you look? Take a closer look. What do you see now? Can you see the second image in this optical illusion? Oftentimes, our brain, when it looks at an image, it makes a quick judgment on what it sees. And only if we stop, pause, and reframe what we're seeing do we get to see the second image. This reminds me of an experience with a classroom uh, that I had in North Minneapolis. I knew a group of 11 and 12 year olds while I was running a youth development program in North Minneapolis. These kids were full of energy. They're the kind of students that can make you laugh without even trying. At times when I visit their classroom, 
their teaching fellow shared concerns that students were not engaging in the lesson or that they seemed a little distracted during class. From the outside, I guess that could have been true on the surface level. The students may have seemed distracted or uninterested and at times they were talking while their teacher was talking and maybe because they weren't getting that kind of eye contact, they sometimes missed a prompt that she was making. However, when I sat through the class and I closely observed what was actually going on and I listened to what they were saying and observed what they were doing, they were ahead of the activities in the lesson plan that they were engaging with. The summer teaching fellow and I began to explore ways to match the pacing in the class so that it met what the students needed. It turned out the students were passionate about science, especially when it could be applied to their life or demonstrate a real impact on their communities. As a result of this insight, the teaching fellow understood the students' passions, their talents, and their desires, and she planned a lesson for them around the Flint water crisis, resulting in the students presenting a summer showcase that highlighted the science behind the crisis, including the health and learning implications for students and families. And it also explored the political and economic context and implications of the water crisis. Taking that next step to see what's truly going on behind student behavior wasn't at first obvious, but it resulted in this case in exceptional outcomes. The students were excellent, but that excellence needed to be fully truly understood and seen. Oftentimes, as a teacher or a youth advocate, a mentor, or even a parent, you're focused on the gaps and the challenges that students are experiencing without balancing those things that are, they are truly exceptional in. At Teach for America alum, Allie Rockwell was a biology teacher at Higher Ground Academy in St. Paul. And while she was in her third year teaching, she advocated to teach the school's first ever AP biology class. In a school with a student population that's nearly 100% Somali, and in this case, in Ms. Roxwell's class, almost majority female, this class represented a transformational opportunities for her students. One student in particular, Sam Sam, chose to return to her sophomore year just to take AP biology, even though her family had moved and transportation to school had become a real challenge. Not only did she earn an A in the course, but she passed her AP exam at the end of the school year. And during her junior year at Irondale High School, she was able to take anatomy and physiology, a course that's typically only offered to seniors. Allie herself summed it up perfectly saying, achieving educational equity is about building and maintaining relationships, listening and responding to the needs of the community in which you work. Become a student of your students, know them and support them. There are many other things like this going around on at classrooms across the Twin Cities, and that innovation and that drive is propelling students to achieve incredible results. I was once working at a youth development program, and I learned that a student, let's call him David, was kicked out of the program for poor attendance. I asked my team kind of, do you know what was going on? And their remarks were really vague. They mentioned that the student said he was moving, but it turned out the student actually hadn't moved. Um, and they'd been giving me like various excuses for what the action might have been. After some digging, a counselor at American Indian Madness School in St. Paul informed me that the student's mother had been in a domestic violence situation and had been trying to move out for a while. Now, while she was unable to relocate, she did finally find a safer location in the Twin Cities for her son. This meant that the youth development program had made a mistake in not digging deeper to understand the reason behind the student's attendance. And yet, as I was discussing with my team, they were kind of reluctant to own up to it or to think about what we could do to correct the problem. They were really a great team, like, it, and they were really capable, but what happens is sometimes things fall through the cracks. This story makes me reflect on the implications of not listening to students and to digging deeper. And when we take our, this opportunity to see our mistakes as a learning opportunity, we can make changes. Otherwise, a student might think they've been kicked out of the program for something that they did wrong, or they're not worthy in being in the program at all. Self-work is an important part of youth development, of mentoring and education. Confronting your own limitations creates room for growth and models for healthy behavior and accountability to youth. I make mistakes. Teams I lead will make mistakes. But I know if I truly want to not continue making mistakes, I have to create a culture where I can learn, where others can push me in areas where I might not be acting in consistency with my values. 
I want students to know that they have a voice in decision making, especially decisions that impact them and their future. Understanding what goes on beyond the four walls of your classroom can be the difference between passing a class and completing a program or truly guiding a student to their full potential. As educators, youth advocates, and mentors, we have a responsibility to help students develop a greater sense of agency and an orientation that follows them well beyond the time they spend in our classroom or program. Some people often defeat themselves by acknowledging the way system, the system sets back students without understanding the role that they can play to push back against that system. They might say, poverty is affecting my students, or there's so many things beyond the control of my classroom, or I have so many students that for whom English is not their first language. While this can be true, it is also true that there is space to take action against these systematic barriers. The first step is to transcend this way of thinking. Grisel Vidal Munoz is a first year core member in the Twin Cities and an English language development teacher at Hiawatha Academies. Grisel immigrated from Cuba to the United States with her family as a middle school student and began the really sensitive journey of tackling barriers faced by many ESL students at a young age. To her, advocating for her students goes hand in hand with orienting to a definition of success that goes beyond the four walls of her classroom. She sees her own experience reflected in her students. The students she works with are the same age she was when she moved from Cuba with her family. When asked what her vision for success for herself is, Griselle said it lies in building strong student academic confidence and helping them succeed in all their classes and growing their English language development. She shows up at all their fifth grade classes, even virtually, to help them know that she's there for them and is there in with them to build community. As an educator, she's already thinking about how she can lay the foundation for their success in middle school, high school, college, and beyond. I bring up Griselle's example because it helps me reflect on the orientation to teaching that educators and youth development advocates need. Are you trying to get through the curriculum or the content of your program or instill in your students the skills and leadership they need that will hold them for the next chapter of their lives? How are you actually working on that? How are you developing their own leadership skills within your classroom that will follow them for a lifetime? Essentially, students are the ones doing the work to succeed all the time. It's hard work. But teachers, mentors, parents, and other adults play an important role in building agency through choice and guidance. When we go beyond the lesson plan and leverage a deep connection to unpack the context for our students, we have an opportunity to create learners for life. Let's take a look at what this commitment means personified and extended over years. I had a student named Doratu who migrated from Ethiopia to Minnesota with her father and her sister. She was an amazing young student. She was 11 years old and already showing such promise at a young age. She started school in an ESL program and was navigating that as a middle school student. Our program staff and educators took the time to get to know her, identify opportunities that she could take advantage of. Doratu and her family were able to access pathways that set her up on a pathway to success, disrupting her educational experiences for the better. Doratu went on to attend Humboldt High School in advanced placement classes in St. Paul instead of not being mainstreamed. She got a full ride Gates Millennium Scholarship to Pomona and is working at Facebook today and she launched an NGO to help women and girls in Ethiopia. Understanding your student, their success, their lives adds dimension to how you work with them. And that context is extremely valuable. The best educational practices take place in environments where everyone learns. Educators, youth program leaders learn alongside their students. Most of the stories I've shared with you have been about learning from the student's perspective. But equally important is shaping programs and curriculum is the learning that comes from students. One of the greatest experiences I had was intentionally designing uh, a new program within our LEAD program, which is a mini MBA prep program for Asian American, Native American, Black and Latinx student, students at the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth College. We launched a new partnership with the Native American Finance Officers Association, and that added a new context to the LEAD program. It focused on Native American entrepreneurship and economic mobility. The program was diverse by design and brought together students from different backgrounds and identities. 
For me, this was an opportunity to not only unpack identity and the experience for the learners in the classroom, but for myself as well. While I had been familiar with my own Black and Jamaican experience and grew up in close proximity to Latinx communities, it was the first time for me learning and creating a learning environment for an exchange of ideas around Indigenous history and economic practice. As an anti-racist educator or advocate for youth, we can make the most impact when we learn alongside our students. In this program, the LEAD program, there was education for everybody involved. I personally learned more about tribal sovereignty and economic development in the history of the United States than I had ever learned before. This further helped me reflect on the interconnectedness and the intersection of identities and experiences in the United States. There is real impact in creating learning opportunities that are inclusive, that celebrate cultures and create opportunities for students to dialogue and learn cross-culturally. These are the five lessons that I've learned over the course of 20 plus years as a student, an educator, an activist, a mother, and a community member. And it also helps me connect to my own ongoing and continuous learning. When my oldest son was getting ready to start kindergarten, we were so excited. He loved learning. He was just so overjoyed. He was the kind of kid that would be like, mommy, did you know this? And did you know that? And he had all kinds of facts that he loved to tell. He'd gone to a Spanish immersion preschool and pre-K program with a global curriculum, and he was on fire to learn. Well, when I was tucking him in one night to bed within the second week of kindergarten, he looked like something was on his mind. So I asked him, how was your day? He kind of said, okay, and he seemed a little quiet. And after a while of silence, he looked up at me and said, in class today, we were in stations and a little girl came up to me and she said she didn't like the color brown. I paused and listened to him. I could tell my six-year-old was trying to make sense of this little girl's statement in his mind. He knew something was going on but he didn't fully comprehend and he couldn't comprehend how he should feel. He was upset by it. And he told me, Ma, we weren't coloring, like there weren't any crayons around. He didn't know what to do with this. And his teacher didn't either when, she shared this in, when I shared this incident with her. She was not adequately prepared to foster this conversation with me as a parent or with her students. And, you know, this is not an indictment of her as a teacher or educator per se, but of our system and our society. My son's experience prompts me to think back on my own experience that I shared with you almost 40 years ago. I know what it felt like because I'd migrated from Jamaica to the United States just before, just before turning six, the same age as my son. I had never confronted racism or the notion that my skin color could determine how I was treated until I got to America and enter kindergarten. One generation later, and we are still grappling with this is issue. In order for us to change things 40 years from now, we have to choose to be different, have different conversations right now. It's not okay for generation after generation to experience this tension, this sense of not belonging. We need to be seen. We need to be heard. We need to feel like we're valued and believed in in our classroom, in our programs, in our communities, in our organizations and beyond. When we don't tackle racism and its impacts, our silence speaks volumes and we miss an opportunity to foster greater learning, curiosity and a deeper connection to our humanity. We owe it to our students and the next generation coming after us to embrace this opportunity to grow in our understanding of anti-racism. Students will give us grace if we give them action. When we don't meaningfully see students and families and we don't disrupt experiences that they're having in our schools that are one, potentially traumatic, two, failing them in terms of their educational progress, or three, not invested in their journey as a student and learner, is very difficult. Disrupting these experiences are critical and the lessons we learn are important. Student voices and student stories matter, not just when I was growing up, not just when I was reflecting on the five lessons I was sharing with you, but it matters now and it matters for the future. If you take anything away from the stories and the five lessons that I've shared with you, I hope it's that you have the power to change your sphere. You have influence, you have impact. 
I'd like to end with a quote from Bell Hooks on the autonomy of youth. Love is as love does. And it is our responsibility to give children love. When we love children, we acknowledge by our every action that they are not property, that they have rights, and that we respect and uphold their rights. Without justice, there can be no love. Thank you. Thank you so much, Makisha. That was excellent. Oh, uh, so many things I want to talk about during the Q&A. So this is a quick reminder to submit your questions to the Q&A tonight as they pop up for you. You can do that at any time during the presentations uh, and also when I'm talking. Uh, we'll get to as many of those questions as we can at the end of the program. So next, we'll hear from young speakers from the Youth Leadership Initiative who will present their ideas on how to create a world centered on youth, where young people are excited to learn, be themselves, and transform their communities. The Youth Leadership Initiative is a community leadership program for high school students that's designed to strengthen self-awareness, develop cross-cultural leadership skills, and put skills learned into action in a multicultural and global community. YLI is youth-centered with young people determining the focus of their cultural exploration sessions and community issues to be addressed. The organization also has a team of youth mentors who are peer leaders in the program. The role of adults here is to support, encourage, share knowledge and power, and create access and opportunity. Please welcome our four speakers from YLI or who are here tonight, Si Cheng, Sanama Shea, Jolie Wu, and Pa Gi. These four are literally experts in creating a youth-centered world. Thanks to all of you for being here. Take it away. Thanks, Adia. All we need to remember, there is an edge and grow our dreams beyond it. Black feminist activist, Adrienne Marie Brown, calls for us to dream beyond the edge and use our radical imagination to build the foundation for a better future. We are inviting you all on this journey of the imagination with us. Imagine a world that prioritizes young people and centers their perspectives. With fewer barriers to limit our imaginations and our potential, the world would be so much more creative. Nothing is impossible and everything is possible. There will be many ways to do things, many more opportunities to develop, and many more spaces for everyone to fit in and be successful. A world that centers young people and the joy of growing and experimenting would create a more open, kind, and understanding community. In this world, change and mistakes are valued and embraced. Being partners with youth was, would come as second nature. Together, we would work to find common ground and create new systems that are inclusive of different types of learning. Every young person would understand that their biases are not inherited, but taught. In this world that promotes love and care, young people will grow up receiving positive support and growth which in turn would produce healthier communities. Communities that would care about each other would work to dismantle systems that harm young people, like adultism, white supremacy culture, racism, sexism, and much more. We imagine that this world is possible. Hi everyone, my name is Sanam and I use she, her, hers pronouns. Hi everyone, my name is Jolie Wu and I go by she, her pronouns. Hi everyone, my name is Paki and I go by she, her, hers. Hi, uh, my name is C. I use she, her pronouns. We are here at Ed Talk today because we are excited to share our lived experiences, expertise, and wisdom with you all around youth leadership, youth voice, and youth equity. Whether you're someone working in the education system, working in the after school programming field, or a community member who just supports youth power, welcome! In this brief moment that we have together, we are excited to share, you, share with you our visions of a youth centered world. And what it might look like in our daily lives. Imagine a community that centers young people's intersectional identities, that embrace conversations and structural changes around diversity and inclusion. Imagine a frigid winter morning in January. You and I are attending a retreat centered on community building. After finishing up an energizing activity on the basement floor, we join 50 other high school youth upstairs for the next activity. As we enter this space, we are asked to stand in a circle. The high school age facilitators, the youth mentors, explained, this activity will be a vulnerable moment for everyone. We want to remind you all of the community working agreements we have created together on the first day of the retreat. First, we encourage you to listen to understand. Second, to host yourself when needed. 
Third, to let personal stories shared by your peers linger only in the space, but to take the learning with you. And finally, to trust in the process. Now, ask the partners to your left and right for consent to hold their hands and close your eyes. If a statement we read out loud applies to you, step inside the circle. Do not let go. The first statement is, I believe I am a leader. I stepped forward, but none of my partners on the left and right of me do. The next statement is, I often hear gunshots in my neighborhood. With my eyes closed, I can feel my hands pulled forward as I sit in place. After several rounds of this push and pull movement, we finally opened our eyes and sat in a circle facing each other. The facilitator proceeded to ask us, what happened? How did you feel as you walked forward in a circle? Or if you stayed in place, how did that make you feel? What was the purpose of this activity? I heard responses like, it was really hard to feel my friends move forward to statements like, I'm not proud of my culture. Or actually it felt really reassuring to see that there were others who felt the same way as me. I thought, that's why the theme of this retreat is community. That night, as I laid on the camp bunk bed, reflecting on the day and on this activity in particular, something finally clicked. My friends who came from different parts of the Twin Cities, who came from different schools, different cultural, racial, and social economic backgrounds, we all stepped into the circle. We heard phrases like, I've been told by an adult that I'm not good enough. How are we interconnected? What other similar issues impact us? What bigger structural forces influence our everyday lives? Another voice inside my head also whispered, what would a world that valued including young people and ensuring that they feel they are enough look like? I went to sleep that night puzzling over many complex things. Imagine a world where young people are leaders of today. Youth are leading youth, facilitating and talking about issues that are that are important to them or topic they like. Do an activity that help you lead and learn about the real world, no matter what your age is. You see youth leading youth activity and talking in front of you around topic like sin, cultural identity, community, action project, and allyship. Your voice and your opinion are being heard and you feel welcome. You feel an increased sense of confidence in yourself and your ability to create change. Then one day you become the person leading the activity and doing the talking. You hear from other youth and value their opinion, even if you disagree. When you are stuck and need help, other youth come to help you. In this world, even if I'm not confident in leading people and other youth, I was never discouraged. Instead, as I keep going, and with the encouragement of other youth, I learned and did things I never, I never done. I came out of my comfort zone and I started conversation with other youth and got to know more people. I saw and met people from different backgrounds that I wouldn't have met if I didn't come out of my comfort zone. I've seen someone younger than me leading me and talking to me. They were brave to talk to in front of other youth all that I went through gave me strength to become a better leader to myself and to others. I imagine myself in a youth-centered space where kindness is abundant, smiles are rampant, and the sound of laughter fills up the precious space of the room. You feel free to make friends, talk to others, and express your inner self, and to be completely vulnerable. You feel true freedom and bliss. This is a story about the best kind of friendships, a friendship where love and compassion is plentiful, where you are constantly laughing until your stomach aches, where you feel at home with each other. This is our story. We didn't know each other, but we were cramped together in a campsite in the middle of nowhere. I was overpacked and you were underpacked. You stared at me with kind eyes. Throughout the day, we did many activities together. We laughed, talked, learned each other's likes, dislikes, and opinions. Although we were becoming friendly with each other, our friendship still felt a little distant and cold. The Hmong Odyssey simulation closed the gap in our friendship, running and hiding, tightly clasping each other's hands. We trusted one another not to get caught. We held our breath, shaking from the cold, trying to lower the adrenaline flowing through our bodies. It was almost slow motion. We were running, flashing lights. Our hearts were one, connecting through trust and respect. I felt your grip tighten. 
You never let go. Stop, the guard screamed. I knew that this would be the end. We held our hands up in fear, but soon dropped the facade. That was crazy, right? I know, I was so scared. We gushed all night to each other. At this moment, I knew that I would be able to trust you. Later the next night, we held a dance party with the, all the other people in our group. Flashing lights, dark rooms, dancing our hearts out. I spun around the room, galloping around to Gangnam Style by side. I felt so close in love. I smiled. The familiar warmth of love and kindness filled up the room. I felt at home. When I got back to my cabin, I reminisced about how wonderful it felt to be in such a kind place. The bright smiles, compassionate hugs, the kindest eyes I've ever seen. This is what true community felt like. Like a warm blanket in a hot cup of tea on a rainy day. Like a soft lilac sweater. I could not wait for the next day. Imagine a world where self-growth is promoted in an environment free of judgment, but is also equipped to educate one on culture, gender, and identity in order to better understand not only yourself, but the people around you. A world where you see leaders that are just like you and aren't like you at all, and accepts and even nurtures your personal leadership style. A huge step in understanding what leadership was for me personally was when I first saw and understood the diversity of what it means to be a leader. Not only can people of color be in leadership positions, but there are all kinds of ways to be leaders, outspoken, funny, and extroverted, but even more shy and more soft-spoken. That experience had a lasting impact on me, and little did I know then that this space, and perhaps this world, thrived from accepting and supporting all sorts of leadership styles. This opened my mind and perspectives, and was the beginning shift of what a leader look, used to look like in my mind. Someone white who talks loud and orders people around. With these new role models entering my life, I began to see myself as a leader. Not having to be loud, not ordering people around, but working and building something together with them. Through interactive activities, critical questions and reflections, I was able to reach such a level of self-growth and not only my leadership, but also understanding the people around me. I believe that providing youth with the space and tools to allow themselves to grow and to question who they are, it is able to promote transformative leadership in many ways. Never before had I truly reflected on my identity as a 14 year old. Although in a sense, I'm glad that my reflection started here. This was a space provided for me to talk about culture, gender, and nationality without judgment, but also provided the tools to break down and understand what different parts of my identity really meant. In this space, I could personally think about and question, yeah, who am I? On the inside and out, and then how to later on connect my identity and experiences to others through the crossroads of intersectionality. I remember learning and realizing that everyone is not only different in numerous ways, but similar too. Whether they shared similar identities or not, everybody could connect to one another. It was just a matter of understanding that. With this, one is able to understand and empathize better with communities and the others around them to create a better space to work together and create change. Looking back now, I have an overwhelming sense of pride and gratitude towards myself and the space that made this all possible. I was able to understand and reflect, even if it was only a couple of years ago, it still has greatly contributed to the way I hold myself now, and most likely how I will continue to spread teachings. <laughs> I am even continuing to do so outside of the space by creating a workshop for Big Brother Big Sister that talks about and I that talks about identity and opens up questions to youth to reflect about. We took you all on vivid journeys of our imagination. This is not just an imaginative story about us, but a compilation of real experiences that we have had at the Youth Leadership Initiative Program. We are current and former youth mentors or leaders in the Youth Leadership Initiative, a community-based leadership development program for high school students in the Twin Cities. We call it YLI for short. Our organization's vision is creating a community that is inclusive, authentic, and just. This vision guides our mission, which is to develop the next generation of leaders who reflect the community and who are prepared and committed to contribute their talents to build a thriving, inclusive, just, and multicultural community. We also elevate the voice, power, and participation of young people, as well as build the capacity of individuals and organizations that work with youth. Lastly, we also serve as a catalyst for justice change and transformation in the systems that impact you. So each of our individual stories highlighted a value that YLI or YLI embodies in our work. My story demonstrated YLI's first value of social justice and equity, 
Much of our curriculum is centered on racial equity and critical multiculturalism. Alongside understanding social justice issues and equity, Wildlife has also embedded this in our culture. We share power resulting in youth adult partnerships um, that restructure and dismantle traditional relationships and practices. The second value is youth leading youth and wildlife. We center youth when it comes to decision making. We hear from, out from our youth their, from their opinion to improve program. Wildlife let youth take the lead, facilitate activity, and do program evalu evaluation. The third value is community. We create brave spaces where compassion, trust, belonging, and radical love is fostered. The YLI culture builds community in solidarity where young people can be their authentic selves. The last value is transformative leadership. We are constantly learning about different kinds of leadership and ourselves as leaders. We start with our own identities, our relationship with others, and lead together to become catalysts for change. This results in leading with pride in who we are and our lived experiences. The journey towards actualizing these values and then practicing it in our organization level was and continues to be a work in progress. The first step towards making our vision and value possible, which Paul just mentioned earlier, uh, was to acknowledge and view young people as partners who have expertise and knowledge of their own. We share decision-making power with our youth and allow them the freedom to develop and impact our program design. So for example, two core structural aspects of our program are cultural sessions where youth explore a cultural identity of their choosing and action teams where youth research and develop a community action project on issues important to them. Uh, young people are not only involved in program implementation, they're also leading our program evaluations, recruitment and program curriculum. We were really able to center our work on young people and their ideas because of our belief in the abilities of young people. Secondly, and in alignment with this framework is our constant practice to listen to young people and include them at all decision-making levels. What this translates to is our dedication to transparency. We are not afraid to tell our young people about our fiscal year budget and work with them to think of creative ways to utilize that money. Another framework that we have is that we center care and relationship building in our work. We always start every meeting with a check-in question that helps center our young people, but also allows us to get to know them outside of our organization. And we always follow up with what they share with us. Alongside this, we always insert play into how we teach concept into youth. Wildlife facilitation model is based on experience learning cycle where we do reflect and apply. For example, we use interactive activities like egg drop where youth have to use limited set of material to protect an egg from cracking, to teach teamwork and communication. Another example where we, we make learning fun is when we train young people to do program evaluations. One important skill to have is observations. One way we train for this is through spot the different art exercise. And lastly, we embrace the chaotic path. The chaotic path is the idea that we have enough people enough resources and enough knowledge to approach our work, but we, we, but we may never know the, how the process will proceed or the outcomes that would result. And that's okay. We embrace that uncertainty because we know that this is where learning and growth happens. So what? How does this apply to your work? Before we end our ed talk, we're going to impart some important pieces of advice to you. We suggest that you reflect deeply on these questions slash statements on how you are incorporating youth voice and leadership in your organization. First, it is important to examine the power structures in your organization. How are you treating your youth and what are your youth actually doing? It is important to have a youth committee slash youth board, but how are you actually incorporating youth in that space? Do they have decision-making power? Are they able to sit on important boards of your organization? Are you transparent about the financial state of your organization with youth? Do youth help create curriculum? Youth leadership must be embedded in every part of your organization to be truly effective. Do a systems mapping of the impacts, harm, and vision you have for young people in your work. Some questions for you to think about are, how are you currently engaging young people? What practices, mindsets, or frameworks about young people does your organization employ? Which of these practices are you personally doing well in and within your program? What are the barriers that you need to address? What do you want to do differently both personally and within your program? And finally, are you living your values? 
the values and mission of your organization. We began with a quote from Adrienne Marie Brown in her ode to Radical Imagination. Our next piece of advice to you is precisely this, use and practice radical imagining. Radical imagination is a choice of courage, a collective effort, and a tool to shape our present. It allows us to connect institutions, practices, and mindsets together so that we can begin to unroot the cause of our oppression and plant new seeds that are more just, equitable, and kind. The Youth Leadership Initiative introduced me and to all of us um, concepts like power sharing, youth equity, youth voice, and youth power before I even realized that these kinds of development are rare in youth work. These were Wiley's antidotes and solutions to tackling issues like adultism and ageism at its roots. I was fortunate to have these experiences that showed me a world where young people are cared for is possible, yet you don't necessarily have to have my experiences to dream beyond the edge. We ask you to start with a simple question of what if, or how about, or even I believe. And lastly, remember that equity is an ongoing process. When you are doing social justice work, you are committing to a process of reflections and change. We invite you to always center reflection in your work. By acknowledging growth and as well as area of improvement, we are constantly moving toward progress. And with that, thank you for coming to our Ed Talk. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, C, Sanam, Jolie, and Paji for sharing such incredible insights tonight. I feel like I learned quite a few things from you all. So I'm really excited to learn a little more. Um, now is all of you who are here in attendance, this is your chance for conversation with our Ed Talks presenters through our Q&A. Uh, please write your questions in the Q&A. You can find the button down at the bottom of the screen uh, so you can enter your questions there. And we'll get to as many as we can. So with that, I invite uh, our presenters tonight to turn on their video so we can see them live. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. Is everybody here? Yeah, great. Um, I really had, I, I always say this every time. <laughs> it feels like maybe it's getting repetitive for folks who have come a lot. But I really learn a lot every time that I come to one of these. And I'm, I'm so excited to dig a little bit more into what you all have talked about tonight. Um, so my, let me check the Q&A button. Nobody's written anything yet. Uh, don't be shy. Uh, go ahead and throw your questions in there. Uh, my first question was, um, in gathering, Makisha, it's for Makisha. When you were gathering students uh, for, to have that discussion with them, it was a little bit back. So um, I am, forgive me if I don't give it the right name, it was a round table of sorts with students. Um, and you were asking them about what that would look like if they were centered in education. How did you gather them for that? Um, did, was it something that they were already uh, participating in and you just took them aside for a little bit of time? Or what was that like? Yeah, oftentimes when you want perspective from students, it's, it's great to kind of be in community with them. So I had had the opportunity to come to a couple of different um, events in the Twin Cities that were where um, students from Venture Academy were attending. And the students, you know, when I was talking to them about what I was doing, they're like, we'd love to share our perspective on what should happen in education. So actually the students from a conversation and dialogue initially at like a fair or like an education event in the Twin Cities reached out to me. Um, and I knew the principal at the time. And so I said, yeah, I'd love to come and just hear their thoughts on education. So the students were a mix of first years, um, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. Some had been on like a, a youth leadership group at the school and others were um, you know, still involved in other types of activities. So it was a mix of students at various levels and we provided pizza and all the things to make them truly feel comfortable. And then they kind of facilitated the discussion and I was there to listen and to ask questions as they came up. So it was a really um, dynamic conversation and something that stays with me even to today. I love that. Um, oh, we've got a question coming up and I will get to that in just a moment. I want to uh, check in with uh, each of the YLI speakers and uh, hear about what your role is uh, at YLI. 
Um, Shelly, since you're next to Makisha on my screen, <laughs> why don't you go ahead? Yeah, so um, me, Paji, and Sanam, we are currently youth mentors at the uh, Youth Leadership Initiative. So basically, our job is to uh, create programming, work on recruitment, and, you know, just carry on and like continue and make even better the wildlife legacy that we've had of building community and just creating leaders I mean bringing out leaders because all of us are leaders <laughs> you just don't know it yet exactly. yeah Excellent. uh see would you like to say anything yeah um so I am a wildlife alumni so I was a participant like back in 2012 and then I became a mentor I was peer nominated to be a mentor um for two for three years and that's what I did and now graduated from college come back and just really um really believe in the magic and value of this program so I'm one of the youth mentor coaches so we sort of um, support the youth the youth mentors in creating curriculum and also doing recruitment um I'm also sort of independent contractor for YLI right now um, helping to design our fall programming and our um, consulting side of the program. What, have, what will that look like? Have you, is it still in its nascent stages or do you have a little bit of an idea? Yeah, we're still brainstorming, but we, um, we're trying to sort of integrate um, our cultural identities. So these can be um, gender, uh, sexuality, race, ethnicity, um, and action. So social issues, social justice issues in the community, uh, trying to sort of find like how can we sort of create one large program just focused on those two aspects because I feel like um, I really do believe the personal is political. Um, how do we sort of understand how like different uh, policies in fact impact, impact us at the the day, like in our daily lives and how do you, we sort of unlearn those things and try to really visual, visualize those structures. Excellent. Thank you. Paji or Sanam, do you want to add anything? Um, well, Jolie said it pretty good. <laughs> uh, I am a youth mentor at YLI. I was a participant in the past. So like uh, Jolie said before, just to create curriculum, um, bond with the participants, uh, lead the retreats, facilitate activities, and just delve into more of our identities. So cultural, um, gender, sexuality, all those types of things. Excellent. Okay, uh, well, we've got a question from uh, uh, an attendee that says, for the youth panelists, how has having voice and leadership changed how you show up in spaces? Uh, who would like to start? Um, I guess I can answer this first. Um, I think that as like a youth, like as someone who's younger, it's very difficult to have a space like and to make yourself known because people are always, always tend to underestimate you or ignore your presence because you are younger and to assume that you don't know or that you're disinterested or that you don't care or that you're not smart enough to even keep up with the conversation. Yeah. But honestly, being in wildlife has helped me expand my voice and make sure that people know that like I'm here, I'm also part of the conversation and my opinion and perspective matters as well. So um, just also making sure that people know that like, like youth are valued and we're not just like people you can make decisions for, like our opinion matters too. What does that look like uh, when you, is it when you feel like someone is either just counting you or not listening? Uh, what does that look like when you make sure that they know that youth matter? Well, at least for me, everyone's different, but I'm a very outspoken person. So just addressing it in the moment and saying, hey, I would like to um, put my opinion in this. And when I notice that like 
something is supposed to be youth led, but like it's just like a bunch of adults and one like one per, like youth. Like I'm like, well, <laughs> let me let me share my perspective here. <laughs> also, like you can't assume like someone else's perspective you don't know. Mm -hmm. So just making sure that like also putting in my opinion, just generally in a conversation so people know, like, I'm active, I'm listening, and I actually have an opinion that I want to be heard. Awesome. Anyone else want to chime in with that? Yeah, and I think on what Sanam says, um, I know interacting with administration in schools and other organizations can be really daunting, especially when you're young, because, you know, even phone calls are scary, you know? Um, but I think passion takes a large part of um, interacting with those places because I know that when I want to do something and I feel like my voice needs to be heard or or um, the representation needs to take place, it's it's trusting yourself and also the people that are supporting you. Excellent. See, Panji. Yeah, I would add that it's definitely made me more fearless um, having voice and also having that understanding that my voice is valuable. Um, like I wrote a letter to one of my after school programs saying, hey, here are all the things you can change. Um, I'm here to support you. Um, and that courage led me to join like other youth organizations um so for example uh central public school has like this program uh, for our youth um it's the student advisory engagement engagement advisory board so um like while i show me that i can do all of these things i can speak to a group of adults um who have a lot of power in shaping our education um i could teach other adults how to do um youth programming or how to share power with young people. And I don't have to be, wait to become an adult to do that. Um, so it's definitely made me more fearless, uh, but it's also made me question things um, mm -hmm. to always seek who has sort of like the power to produce knowledge and mm -hmm. for what purpose does knowledge exist and why does it exist? Um, so yeah, it's made me more curious. Um, I love that. Um, for me, it made me more confident to be able to speak in front of like more people and I'm able to open my voice or not that I have a voice. Yeah. Excellent. Love that. Um, thank you all. I have another question for Makisha. Um, What would it, so you mentioned a story at the end with, about your son, and I wanted to know what would it look like if that teacher had been prepared to have that conversation? What would that have looked like? That's a great question. Um, and in part, it's because I can talk about what other teachers have since done for my child too. So I think um, we have increasingly diverse classrooms here in the Twin Cities. And I think it's um, really important for educators to have an opportunity to see, do students have an opportunity to see themselves reflected in their curriculum? So for a kindergarten or first grade or someone who's starting their educational journey, or even a pre-K student, what do the books in your classroom look like? Are they talking about um, the different backgrounds of students? Do they have the opportunity to see a student featured in a story who English is not their first language? I think the way our, our classrooms are set up, the way, what stories we tell, what stories we showcase and have students dialogue in, even as young as five and six years old, really truly matters. I think in a classroom where that level of inclusivity was possible, if a comment was made about not liking a particular, um, the color of someone's skin or not liking that someone speaks another language, I think there's an opportunity for um, the teacher to ground the students on the values that they're setting up for a classroom to be inclusive and to be supportive and to give students the opportunity to have their voice and their background appreciated. I think there's ways that even when things happen, uh, I'm not saying to embarrass a student or have them or um, bring that up in the full class necessarily. I think depending on the age of students, there's ways to do that appropriately. And just affirming, you know, my child in particular right away. I think that's not what happened. And I think when you have an opportunity to do that, 
um, to let a child know that you see them and that you value them and that you uh, are listening to their feelings about being hurt or not feeling like their classroom classmates were supporting them, that's really important. And then as a parent, um, when I brought this issue up, I just wanted to be listened to and I wondered what things were in place at that school to create an environment where youth are appreciated, where they have the opportunity to learn and where they feel like it's a very supportive environment. So to me, I feel like those are some of the foundation and fundamental things that need to be present to build the confidence of our youngest learners all the way to the amazing leaders that we have here on our talk today. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And on the flip side of that, as the parent, how are you uh, working to empower your children uh, so that they use that they end up like these awesome speakers from YLI and use their voice and embrace their power? Um, I appreciate a lot of what um, our youth speakers from YLI have talked about because I think you first find your voice in your own household. And sometimes that's um, intentional in um, some families and sometimes it takes a lot to unpack how your culture or the power dynamic in families are at play. So one of the things that I try to do within my own family, I have three boys, they're nine, seven, and five. Um, I, treat, I try to create opportunities for them to have choices. I try to create opportunities for us to celebrate and differentiate what one likes and what others, you know, like are very different. So I try to do that. Um, I even have a code word with one of my sons when he like wants attention and doesn't feel like his voice is being heard in the conversation, he can say sunshine. And we know, hey, he, he's trying to get into this conversation and somehow he's not being able to get his voice out. So that's um, a tool that my husband and I developed to say, okay, we need to make sure we include him in this next part of the discussion because he's trying to get a word in and hasn't figured it out. Um, so I, I try to do that. And then I try to understand what's happening when there's a behavior or um, operas happening that I don't know what to do with. I think as parents sometimes with COVID, with all the challenges that have been happening with learning, we, I have not always been my best self through that this past year, right? So sometimes it's important for me to step back and say, why am I being triggered or why am I being anxious or frustrated in this conversation? Is it really something my child is doing or is it something from my own past that I'm processing or am I tired, exhausted, right? And so Often with young people, especially the age of my kids, I wanna make sure that I create the environment for them to express their frustration, their joy, their love, whatever that is, and not suppose my feeling on it in ways that aren't helpful for them getting out what they're trying to communicate with me, with their dad, with other adults and other um, children and friends in their life. So it's not easy. <laughs> and we've seen this last year and a half, um, there's definitely joys and struggles in that, but that's one of the things that I'm trying um, as a parent. And I try to tell my, my teachers for my sons, you know, that aspect, what's the best thing about them? What's their superpower? To try to reinforce that all children have that excellence within them, even on their worst day. You asked about the panel, um, the focus group I did with students. One of the things the students said to me is like, everybody deserves the chance to have a bad day and not have that define who they are forever, right? that happens. And you want to start a new day, renewing your relationship with each other, being in community and restoring um, your, your collaboration with each other. And I try to do that at home. And I hope more folks in education and youth out of school time programs also take in, on that mindset. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I want to move on to a question from Megan. Uh, Megan says, thanks for sharing your perspective tonight. My question is what helps you feel confident with interacting with administration in schools or other forms of leadership and organizations? I wanna help my students tap into this, but I'm not necessarily sure where to start. I think this is for our YLI uh, presenters. I guess I can speak on this and kind of uh, elaborate on a couple questions that are asked. Um, I think in education, for it to be for children or for youth, it really is not designed to help us express our thoughts, ideas, or our feelings um, without being silenced, dismissed, or put aside. Um, and like Nikisha said, or defining who you are um, and not giving given a second chance to have uh, the education that everyone deserves. Um, every child deserves to be treated specially because we are special, we are gifted, every single one of us. But anyways, um, so basically what I would say is that when the adult is open to listening, 
when you're expressing your ideas and your thoughts and they're not like, oh, are you sure? Second guessing you, trying to say that you're wrong, trying to give other reasons why that may not be correct when sometimes it just is. And just to listen and to open your mind about that perspective. Um, and there are many different ways that people are silenced in education. Um, but for me, when teachers don't speak up about injustices that are going on in their classroom, even if it's as simple as just saying, uh, like Makisha said, maybe in the situation the teacher could have been like, hey, pulled the uh, child aside and said, uh, everyone is beautiful. <laughs> like even something as simple as that, maybe worded better, but just addressing, making it safe, making it a safe space for everyone to make sure that everyone is cared for and listened to. Um, so students don't feel silenced or oppressed in your classroom. Excellent. Anyone else want to jump in? Yeah, and I think with that, um, our entire speech was like about a youth-centered space. And when I was writing my speech, I was just thinking about what if YLI was not something that I had to go and seek by myself? What if YLI was what we had in school? What if we provided a space for students to be themselves, learn about themselves, and just feel safe in that space? And um, I think that would be, it would change so many lives, produce so many like healthier people and for kids in speech, like make healthier communities. It just makes so much sense to me. <laughs> Um, something that I've been told by mentors over and over again is that um, this, your stories are yours alone and there's no, it's never a wrong answer because your existence itself is not wrong. And so I, I think that to assure um, young people that like no one can take those experiences from you and no one can criticize you for those experiences because it's yours. Um, also, um, more practical matters, just to practice and practice and practice and practice. I'm always, I think the nervousness will never go away. That nervousness is proof that like you value this. Um, so maybe to sort of reframe that, hey, it's okay to be nervous. That means that like, this is very important to you. Um, so let's continue to practice and do rehearsal. So you'll be more confident to speak in front of these adults. Um, and it's also okay if you make a mistake because you're not graded for this, unless you are, but also at the end of the day, grades aren't everything. Um, yeah, so just in addition to what Sanaa and Julia have already said, just to be there to encourage and to support. Um, I would say to build a connection. Yeah. Will you say a little bit more about that? Um, I feel like if we build connection with each other, we would be more confident to talk to each other more. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Um, I know we are uh, winding down on time here, so I want to kind of wrap a couple questions in together. Uh, there was one about, I had one, and then there was one also about sharing some moments of joy. Um, I was, when I was listening to you, I, uh, talking about your experiences at the, the retreat when you were together, uh, and that feeling, I kind of get that when I teach at a camp that I've been teaching at for 10 years, like I never want to leave that space. Like it feels magical. It feels like this is a sacred space that we have together. Um, so I totally get what you're saying. And I'm wondering, because we always have this challenge, like this is our camp director exhorts us to take that out into the world with us uh, when we're, we're not in this magical island place uh, where we get to all be together and we have consensus and we have community all the time. So I'm wondering how you all do that. And Makisha, you can answer too. Um, I'm wondering how you all carry that sense with you uh, when you leave and you're in places where you don't necessarily have that same buy-in from everybody. I can start and take an attempt at it and see what um, our wonderful distinguished young people have to say. I think um, when I'm in spaces where I'm not sure if everybody's coming from the same perspective, 
one of the things I start with is grounding, you know, grounding in the possibility, grounding in the intentions for us to be together and reminding people of their, the commonality of our humanity. I think, you know, knowing that a lot of us were working from home or working in hybrid environments and all the different places and spaces, like even being in this virtual Hollywood squares box, there's been times where sometimes I'm in meetings or doing different events and it could feel very impersonal. So I think Apaji's comment about the connection being really important. I try to start those spaces with intentionality around that connection and what that means, what it means for us to be in space together, recognizing that people could choose to be elsewhere. And I think um, starting from that frame has been really helpful. Something that I've done in um, youth programs I've been in, or I've even seen some of our, um, our core members and our alumni educators do, is giving um, students and others in the space a chance to create what the norms are for that space. And it might be the beginning of the school year, what do you want the culture of this classroom to feel like? And not only having people voice that, but recognizing that some people are more introverted and it's not easy to say that out loud. So creating multiple ways to gather that input so that there's a feeling of co-creation in the space and then ownership. And then I, um, I channel an amazing friend of mine, Dr. Joy, who says, remember that you're all awesome, brilliant, and truly remarkable. And so I try to get folks to listen to others with that intentionality, with holding that within them. And so when you're listening to even like, let give people that sense of energy when you're interacting with them. Um, and I think it just creates a much more openness to conversation and dialogue, even if there's lots of difference, even if there's conflict or tension. Conflict and tension is not necessarily a bad thing. It means you're onto something and there's an opportunity to continue to explore together. Yeah, I want to add to Apology and Akisha's notion of community, because I think the magic isn't in the place isolated from the world. I think the magic is in the community and the relationships we have with each other. And as someone who like left that community briefly for four years, it was really hard um, to be in a new place and to feel like, oh my gosh, this isn't like what I would expect it. So I went to college in the East Coast. Um, as someone from the Midwest, it was a culture shock. Um, but even so, I am reminded that like there is community and that I that like all of these friendships I've made at the Youth Leadership Initiative is just a phone call away. It's just a text message away um, and that we can always share and like uh, reminisce about our memories together. Um, and also sort of taking what I've learned and why like I'm planning in every space that I um, go to. So for example, like Keisha said, creating community norms, um, co-creating community norms, or uh, trying to bring in like different less lessons, like listen to understand, take space, mix space, um, as well as like some activities that we do, I'll introduce to um, my friends, so, like Rosebud Thorn, let's do check-ins, um, or um, like what, I can't think of, of these activities off the top of my head, but like just those kinds of things, those many things that like build relationships. Excellent. And I know that if somebody else may want to jump in, but we are at 816, so I want to be sensitive to everyone's time. Um, I want to say thank you everyone for your great questions and thank you to our amazing, amazing presenters. I always walk away from things, these so inspired and that is true tonight as well, um, all of you. Uh, we're wrapping up our ninth season of Ed Talks. So on behalf of the Ed Talks team, I want to say thank you to all of you, deep gratitude to all of you for supporting the program this year and engaging with us in the virtual format. Thank you everyone. Um, planning has already started for our 10th season, so that'll kick off this fall, and we're looking forward to presenting talks from Emerging Voices, which is the theme for next season, and really soon we'll be looking for presenters for the coming years, so keep an eye on your email for more details, or visit our website at achievempls.org slash edtalks. 
Also, uh, as an event attendee, you'll receive a year-end ed, year ed talk survey within the next week or two, along with tonight's survey. So please take five minutes to give us some feedback on the season and what you'd like to see for next year. We'll take your suggestions and ideas seriously as we plan our programs. It's super important to fill out those surveys. Uh, we'll also be sharing tonight's video uh, and great resources, su resources suggested by our presenters, a lot of S's in there, in an email this coming week, so keep an eye out for that too. Thank you again to our generous funder, the Bush Foundation. They make Ed Talks possible. We encourage you to connect with our event co-sponsors, Achieve Minneapolis and the Citizens League to find out about all the great things they're doing in our community and how you can get connected and engaged. Check out their website addresses on our, on our screen. And with that, thank you everyone for joining us tonight and for this season. Good night and take care. <laughs>